Some people think that the way to show the love of Jesus Christ is by maybe wearing a lapel pin or maybe a um, put a bumper sticker on your car that says um, honk if you love Jesus or something of that nature. And I'm not saying you can't do that, but Jesus said, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one to another. Do you remember years ago, reading about the woman that drowned in the waters of Lake Michigan. You remember that story? How that as she was calling out and drowning there, that there were three able-bodied men that stood by the shore and heard her cry out, and they did nothing in order to rescue her that as she was drowning there. After the rescue workers came and pulled the lifeless body of the woman out of Lake Michigan, they approached these men and they asked them why that they had did nothing in order to try to save this woman's life. And their response was revealing. They said, the water was too cold. You know, I think that's a picture of our world today. Do you remember when Jesus was talking to his disciples about the end times in Matthew chapter 24? You remember that? The disciples came along and said, tell us. When shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? This is what the question that the disciples asked, and Jesus went on and gave them many numerous things there in that chapter of uh, things that would transpire. But I only want to give you one today that's found in verse 12 that says, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. We live in a day of abounding iniquity and dwindling love. The motto today seems to be, every man for himself. Is that not true? Is that not the way that it seems to be in our world today? In a society like this, the golden rule is not treat others as you would like to be treated, but instead, today, our motto has become, stand up for your rights and make sure everyone treats you the way that you want to be treated. That's the motto, it seems to be, today. According to current statistics, one of out of every four Americans will be involved in a, a lawsuit of some sort during their lifetime. We've heard of, about all of these. I read a lot of remarkable ones online, and of course we all remember the one about the woman who spilled hot scalding coffee on her, and she sued McDonald's because she spilled the coffee on her. And uh, also we've heard reports of burglars suing homeowners after injuring themselves during a robbery. They got hurt and they, they, they sue the homeowner. And uh, don't forget the stories about the motor homeowners uh, that, that are winning lawsuits after they left the driver's seat because they put the vehicle on cruise control and they got up out of the seat and went to do something. Now, most of you laugh those stories off as urban legends uh, made to show you the absurdity of such frivolous claims, but I'll tell you, you might be surprised about how many of those are true. And I know some of them are. Uh, of what we're dealing with today. But the truth of the matter is, what I'm trying to say to you is that we live in a sick world and our world is in desperate need of love. You see, there's all kind of dating services and secret escorts and personal classified and bars and clubs and all kinds of social organizations. There are illicit websites and chat rooms where you can pursue love without even leaving your home. And all these opportunities, um, they promise true love. They promise real love. But in reality, I think that the old country song is a great example of what we're talking about here. This old country song by Johnny Lee that said, looking for love in all the wrong places, looking for love uh, in too many faces. You remember that old country song? The point is, our world craves love, but they can't find some or another, they can't find that, that fulfilling, that lasting love that they are looking for. The songwriter said, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's too little of. You remember that old song? And it's true, we do need more love. 
But love doesn't make the world go round, but I'll tell you what, it sure does make the trip worthwhile, does it not? It sure is nice. We need to love one another. When the new golden world rule in our world today is look out for number one, with that thought in mind, what does it mean for the children of God? What does it mean for the church of God? It means unbelievable opportunity. And that's the reason why that the church must be a place of love. It's important because the world is starving for love. And that we as Christians know where to find love. And what love is all about because we found it in Jesus Christ. But I want you to see first of all today the mandate of of God's love through us. There in verse 34, a new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. Now there are many that state that they doubt the authenticity, the authority of this command. Many suggest that when our Lord introduced it as being a commandment that he was stating that uh, it didn't have the same authority as the law of the Old Testament and that it was not a commandment like what you would find in the Old Testament, like the Ten Commandments. It was not like that. However, I would tell you that hundreds of commandments embodied by the Mosaic Code are here summarized by Christ when he declares basically the code of love. In fact, we find that the the reiteration of the Old Testament quotation used in Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18 that says, Thou shalt not avenge nor bear grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And the same idea was also conveyed in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And there, my friend, is the motto of Winter Haven Baptist Church. And that is, love God, love others, making a difference. That's what is told in the Old Testament. It is told in the New Testament. I like the way that Lehman Strauss uh, explained it. He said, this new commandment expresses what was intended in the old, namely, that love is the fulfillment of the law. Hence, As we review this lesson today by our Lord, we see the guide that he describes. First of all, we're given a guide for love in God's holy word. That's where the guide is. And of course, we know that the guide for anything that we want to know about is in God's holy word. Amen. So the guide for love is found here in God's holy word. The guide is the love of the Lord Jesus Christ and particularly the, the, the love that he has for us. He loves us. You see, he alone is the perfect pattern of love. And uh, thus we are to learn the law of love and we must look at God's son because as we look at God's son, we find that in him is the love of God perfected. It's in Jesus Christ. In ages past, We understand as we look in the Old Testament that God had spoken through prophets at different and various ways, different times, various ways, revealing himself as the God of holiness, of might, of truth, and of mercy. God revealed himself that way. But not until Jesus Christ came into this world had man known fully the love of God until Jesus came on the scene. In fact, the heart of the Father was never really truly revealed, fully revealed in his infinite love until his only begotten Son, full of grace and truth, left heaven and dwelt among men. You remember, some of you older folk remember that old song, Ivory Palaces, of how Jesus, it talked about how Jesus came out of the portals of heaven and down to this world of woe. And so I, I think of... You think about the many instances and incidents uh, which reveal the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, We think about his miracles. We, We think about his preaching. We think about his praying. However, I believe the embodiment of his love can most perfectly be seen in his submission as Jesus was here on the face of this earth. 
for our eternal love could draw the eternal one from the eternal palace down here to a world of woe. The riches of heaven and earth were his, and yet he became, he became clothed in humility. He was a friend of sinners. That's what Jesus Christ did. He was born, born in a borrowed manger. He traveled on a borrowed boat. He rode a borrowed beast. He worshiped in a borrowed room and he was buried in a borrowed tomb. My friend, such submission could only be prompted by self-sacrificing love. And thus, he is our pattern. Jesus Christ is our example. He is our role model, the guide that he describes in himself. But I want you to see the goal that he uh, demands. Jesus tells us that he loves us, and if he loves us, which he does, then that me, that he tells us that we are to love one another. You see, love is the, one of the grandest themes in all of the Holy Scriptures. However, more wonderful still is the far-reaching effect upon the human race. Does not love have great effect on this human race? Only eternity will reveal the countless numbers of lives that have been won to Jesus Christ. Their lives have been changed because of the love of Jesus Christ that is in the heart of his people. Uh, people of the church, people in the church, the church is to be a place of love. And if it is a place of love, then people will see that love. And many have been changed as a result of that. I think about pagan powers and diabolical leaders, the satanic systems that have been smitten uh, where, wherever the love of Christ has been preached and has been lived. When every other effort has failed, everything that has been tried, love will be the thing that will break through and will triumph. The fact of the matter is that the law of God never brought anyone to Christ. Did you know that? I've been reading through the book of Galatians and you're reminded of that fact once again, my friend, that the law, the law of God has never brought anyone to Christ. It, it is the law that separates us and distances us and, and condemns us from a holy and righteous and a true God. However, I submit to you today that it is the love of God that brings men to Christ. Of course, it's a law that points out and helps us to see where we are as sinners and that we need Jesus Christ. But it is the love of God that brings us to him. Jesus sacrificed. He submitted. He suffered. He took upon him our sin debt, my friend, and he paid the ransom in full. That's what our precious Savior did. And thus, just as he loved us, he commands us that we're to love one another. We are to love people unconditionally, undeservedly. They may be undeserved in uh, our love for them, but we're to do it anyhow unhesitantly. You see, this love is not based upon reciprocation. Or it's, not, it's not based upon response. It's not based upon reward. You know, it's not based in any of those. Th this love finds its root in our Redeemer who loved us and gave himself for us. And my friend, that is the guide that he describes, and that is the goal that he demands. And so this is a lesson to be reviewed. Second of all, today we see the measurement of God's love in us. By this shall all men, verse 35, know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Here we find the second element of the law that is to never be broken. There, not only is there a lesson to be reviewed, but there is also Lord to be revered. And so we recognize him as Lord. That's important. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. So when we learn to love as he loves, then he will be known as Lord. When we can have that type of spirit within us, he will be known as Lord. When we have love for others, Jesus is depicted, he is demonstrated, he is displayed as Lord. When we have love for others, a lot of people want to do all these things out there to show their love for Christ, but the truth of the matter is, Jesus said, we'll love people. 
will love others out there. John was so bold when he said in 1 John 4, 20, if a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loves God love his brother also. What a commandment that we're given here. The fact of the matter is, when we love as he loves, then he will be known as the Lord. People in our community will understand that he truly is Lord. But I want you to not only see that we recognize him as Lord, we reveal him as Lord. What is spoken of here in verse 34 and 35 is an action. It is an action not based upon a reaction. It is something that is given because he has given it to us. And thus when we follow the lesson and we love as he loves, as we can demand in the scripture to, to do, Hear me when I tell you that he will not only be known as Lord, he will be shown as Lord. It is here that our true identity in Christ is manifested. If we love the brethren. If you want to know whether a person is truly a Christian that has the love of God in his heart, well, here's where it's manifested here. It is here upon which our badge and our banner of true Christianity rests. It is here that we testify that we belong to him, that when we truly love one another. I believe Matthew Henry was right when he said, how lovely, <coughs> how lovely a thing would Christianity appear to the world if those who profess it were more actuated and animated by this divine principle and paid a due regard to a command on which its blessed author laid a chief stress. What am, I, what am I trying to say to you today? It is this love that our master demands from us. It is this love that our Lord requires of us. It is this love that our king expects from us. It has to be shown. Uh, we, we show those, the world that we love them, and then we show Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ will be seen. I heard this story, really kind of sad story, surprising story of two social workers that were walking through a rough part of town one night, and they heard moans and groans and cries coming from an alley. As they found their way down the alley there, they found a semi-conscious man there. This man was crying out, help me, and he's very weak as he's crying out, help me, I've been mugged and viciously beaten. And as these two social workers saw this man that had been beaten and crying out for help, they quickly walked out of the alley there. And one turned to the other and said, you know, the person that did that really could use some help. That was a statement that they made. This is a world full of hurting people. And the way that we're going to see the, the love of Jesus, the way that they're going to see it is by seeing your love for them. That's the way they're going to see the love of Jesus. It's just how much you love this world. I ask you the question today, is it always easy to love people? Absolutely not. It's not always easy to love people. I met a lot of people in foreign countries, three foreign countries I was in, uh, in Miami this past week. And uh, in those, I will tell you, I met a lot of obnoxious, annoying, downright rude and hateful people. Did you know that? I had one guy behind me on the plane that knocked my seat so many times, and it was so annoying to me. And then the audacity got up at that, and, uh, and then came up, he was behind, came up, and so somebody's coming, trying to come through, so he sat out on me, you know, on the plane. I'm on the aisle seat there, <laughs> you know? And I'm having to remember, you know, the love of Jesus. I wanted to say something. You want me to tell you what my human mind thought? My human mind thought, I'm going to get up and go to the bathroom. When I come back to him, I'm going to bump his chair real hard. <laughs> that was a human thought. But then I was reminded of the love of Jesus. We have to remember that way. 
You know, people just need Jesus in their lives. Is that not true? Isn't that what they need? They just need the love of the Lord. And in the observation of a couple of our missionaries uh, this past week in uh, uh, Panama and Belize and several other missionaries that I met while I was on this trip, I want to ask you a very pointed and a very direct um, question or questions today. I want to ask you this. Do you think that they, these missionaries that are there, and uh, Belize being a, a truly third world country, I almost think that it's more that way today than what I've been there in the past, uh, looking at that country. But do you think that they like the dirtiness, these missionaries, the dirtiness of that country, of where they serve, and the crooked governments of which they have to deal with? Do you think that they like that? Do you think that they like walking through uh, goat excrement, going into that, uh, these little houses that they go in to where they're dirty and they're infested with bugs? you think that they really enjoy doing that? Do you think that they, they, they like putting their family at risk uh, around uh, being around so many evil people in the, uh, many of these third world countries? Do you think that it doesn't bother them that uh, in their repetitive work that they do, it seems like they do these things week after week, and sometimes seemingly that the work is knowing, going nowhere, but we know that's not true because we know that the Word of God does not return void. But uh, we know God is doing the work, but sometimes from a human perspective, it seems like the work is going absolutely nowhere. And let me ask you around here, in, in our own environment, uh, even for a pastor or our pastors, do you think that it's always easy to deal with people that they say they want help, but they refuse any biblical instruction? They, 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 they say they want help. They say that they want what is right uh, and they want what is good, but yet uh, the house of God is not good enough for them or that they can't go to the word of God and see exactly what God has to say. And thinking about our workers around here, do you think that sometimes that it doesn't get wearing, that week after week after week they continue to serve in a particular area, and maybe in some area that it might even be a little monotonous of some of the things that they do. But I ask you, is a person to do nothing for Christ that he doesn't like to do? So if you don't like to do it, in other words, we're just not supposed to do it, I mean, it's for God, but we're not supposed to do it. Now, I want you to hear me today. I want you to hear what I've got to say. Good missionaries, good pastors, good assistant pastors, and church workers will tell you it has nothing, absolutely nothing to do with liking or disliking these things. It has nothing to do with it. We have orders to go. We have orders to serve. We have orders to love whether we like it or not. That's what God has called us to do. I think about our dear missionary, Vicki Weaver, that has given her life on the field, and many of you perhaps uh, are new members, are new people here, do not understand of the horrible accident that Vicki had there that has left her physically, not mentally, but physically uh, incapacitated to where per, uh, um, Pretty much she has no ability to be able to do ministry there anymore other than being there and praying for her husband. And that is it. And I would tell you, Vicki Weaver gave her life on the field of police to the country that God had called them to and the people that they loved. They love God and they love people. That's what the Bible says. And she gave her life for that. Peter Forsyth said, the first duty of every soul is not to find freedom, but find its master. Jesus is our master, and yet our master has commanded us to love one another. He has demanded that we're to, to love them because he loves us. He has called us to serve. <clears throat> Thus I wonder, are we living in obedience to his command? We live in an obedience to his command. When we love others as he's loved us, then there is a Lord to be revered. And then last of all today, my friend, the meaning of God's love for us. Much has already been said about the fact 
that we are to love others as the Lord loves us, but just what type of love is to be revealed? What type of love is to be displayed? He answers that by telling us about his sacred love for us. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one toward another. Now I call your attention to that word love that is used in this passage. There are three words in the Greek language which are translated love. One of these words tells about the love of passion, of lust, of sensual desire. The second word tells us about a love of impulse, of, a, um, of affection, of natural inclination, speaking about love for family or friends. But the third love is used quite differently in the New Testament. It is a word agape, and it speaks of a character determined by will and not of a spontaneous emotion. And so it denotes the love which chooses its objects with decision so that it becomes self-denying and self-sacrificing. That is a word that's used here, agape. That's what we're talking about. It is agape love. It is unconditional love. It is love in its deepest embodiment. It is sacred love of what we're talking about. Uh, W. Graham Scroggy describes love by saying, Love is not hasty, but patient. Love is not inconsiderate, but benevolent. Love is not envious, but content. Love is not boastful, but unostentatious. Love is not arrogant, but humble. Love is not rude, but courteous. Love is not selfish, but selfless. He goes on and gives many, many more there. Um, Love is not... Uh, irritable but good tempered and uh, it's not vindictive but it's generous many I don't have time to read to you today but that is the love of which we are to love others this way humanly speaking you would think that that's not always possible but in the love of Jesus it is possible someone may have offended you but we are to love them sacredly did you hear me church I know that this goes against a, a, our human way of thinking. As someone has hurt you, but you love them sacredly in spite of that. Someone may have done you wrong, but yet you love them sacredly. Someone may have betrayed your trust. Yes, they may have stabbed you in the back or whatever, but you love them sacredly. This is not love from a human standpoint. We understand that, but it is love from a heavenly standpoint. And that's what God has commanded us to do. That is sacred love. Then we see his shared love for others. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one to another. I often hear people say, I fell in love with him or I fell in love with her. I understand what they mean when they say that. However, in reality, we do not fall in love with someone. We make up our mind to love them. That's what we do. We make up our mind to love them. Any biblical counselors will go through and talk with you about this. The critical point to understand about agape is that you did not fall in love or agape. Then there's no such thing as falling out of love. Uh, oftentimes people come into counsel and wouldn't talk about, well, I don't love them anymore, or I fell out of love with them. Agape is not something that hits you and, and that you just cannot help it. And then all of a sudden it disappears uh, uh, the same way and you can't help that. Some people uh, take that attitude and they make that statement today, but agape is a choice that is independent from any other circumstance or condition life. Did you hear what I'm saying? It is a choice that is based not upon emotion, but upon the will. It is a choice. Jesus Christ, in effect, hear me now, this is an important point. He, in effect, he said, by this shall all the world know that ye are my disciples, because you have chosen to love one another. You've made that choice. It is a choice of will that you're going to love these different ones. 
We love the one who is hard to love. We love the one, uh, the unforgiving one. We love the unappreciative one. We love the unkind one. We love the sinful, the fallen one. We love the immature one. We love them. We have made that choice of will that we are going to love them. Ladies and gentlemen, I tell you today, agape is impossible unless we as individuals, as a church family, walk closely with our God from whom comes the grace and the courage and the commitment to love each other as he has loved us. It's the only way that we can do it. If we are what we say we are, then there will be that love that will be revealed. If we are true Christians like what we say we are. You remember that story of the U USS P Pablo? There was many years ago, from my understanding, a distant relative of ours on that ship. They were captured by the North Koreans. 82 surviving crew members were thrown into brutal captivity during that time. They were treated savagely and inhumanely. Uh, many times uh, to the point of death. On one particular instance of what they dealt with there over many days, uh, 13 of those men were required to sit around in a rigid manner around a table for hours. After several hours, one, a door there by those tables would violently swing open and a North Korean guard would come out and brutally beat the men with a the butt of his gun. He'd come out and beat this man brutally, the one that's sitting in the very first chair. Second day came along, same thing, 13 men sitting there for hours, and the man comes out and he beats the man in the first chair brutally there. Third day, same thing beats him, and uh, then these men realize that this, this young, young soldier is not going to survive. And so every day they switch chairs and they had a different one that was beaten. They would move around like that. It was astounding. It was astounding to those North Korean soldiers there. In fact, it was told that they eventually gave up in exasperation that they could not defeat because of the sacrificial love that those men had one for another. How are we to have a love for the world? Even when this world hates us and abuses us. Why are we to think that this world is to love us? The Bible says that they didn't love Jesus. Look what they did to Jesus as they, they crucified him on the cross of Calvary. How are we to love this world when this world hates us and abuses us? There was a day when we knew not God, and he loved us, even while we were living in our sin. While I'm on the plane to... Belize, I read Dan Weaver's mission letter that he had that told about a man by the name of Big John. And Big John, what had happened there, and of course I got to see Big John while I was there, but um, Big, Big John had grown up. You understand that this is a valley of peace. It's a jungle village. 30 minutes out, you drive out on a rough road out there. I rented a car to drive out there, which really was kind of somewhat of a dangerous thing to do. I was about two hours from the airport, and I knew that it would be difficult for Dan to come to the airport to pick me up with Vicki being in the condition that she's in. And so I drove out there and, and um, 30 minutes out into the, to the jungle and uh, met Big John there. But what happened with Big John, because it's a dangerous place out there, a lot of lawless things going on out there, especially out away from uh, society. And um, it's gotten rough out there around their church at church time. Some of the, uh, a, a couple of gangs that are out there that are causing problems. And of course, there are people that are murdered out there all the time that are taking place. It's a dangerous place. Dan had to hire this, this man by the name of Big John in order to try to watch over during the church service to make sure people are safe. And Dan noticed that over a period of time, of course, John would walk out. They have a lot of buildings there. I think three of those buildings we had uh, influence in helping build. They have about eight or nine buildings there. And John walks around, and he's looking uh, and guarding things. Uh, people there in the community really afraid of John. Uh, I call him, he, they call him Big John, but he's not, a, he's not a big guy. He's a tall guy, 
for a Belizean. Nice looking tall man. He walks around out there, but Dan noticed, our missionary noticed that um, there were a few times he's slipping in the service and listening to what's going on in the service. And then a few weeks no, go by and he notices that all of a sudden, Big John's singing the songs with the people. He noticed after a while that all of the people are clapping their hands and he's clapping their hands with them. And time passes over weeks of period and then asked for at the end of a service of those raise their hand that would like to accept Christ. Thank God one day, Big John raised his hand. And there that week, Dan was able to take him over into one of the rooms and lead Big John to Christ. He got saved. You know, I was sitting around there in a, uh, in a service on Thursday night, they call their TNT. And uh, they start out with the biggest hymn and then they spread out and uh, somewhat like our Awana, some are playing, some are being taught and different things. And so I'm walking around taking pictures and I'm talking with Big John. And I thought to myself, how do I approach him and you know, his new life in Christ in such a, you know, somewhat of a primitive condition here that I can be a help and encouragement to him. And he's standing there and there's another man standing there. And I said, you know, John, I want to tell you about my grandfather. See, there's a lot of farming going on out there. And I said, my, my grandfather was a farmer. I said, he was a poor farmer. He didn't have enough money for seed to plant. Things were hard, they were poor. And while the children were working on the farm, he took a job driving a logging truck. And one day while he was driving that truck, there was a man on the side of the road that was hitching a ride. My grandfather picked him up. I'm telling John this story. And I said, he picked him up and that man began telling my grandfather about Jesus Christ. I said, it was there that day that George Hodges bowed his head and asked Jesus to be his Lord and Savior. I said, all of his eight kids got saved. His eight sisters accepted Christ. All their families accepted Christ. And I said, John, you know what's happened? His life was changed. The families were changed. I said, we have, we have in our family now many that are pastors and many that are missionaries around the world. And I said, all that changed the day that George Hodges accepted Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior. I said, John, things are gonna be different in your life now. God's got good things in store for you and your family. And I'm thankful for that day. And you can say the same. There was a time when we had no hope, but thank God for that glorious day we heard the story of Jesus' love for us. Up Calvary's mountain, one dreadful morn, walk Christ my Savior, weary and mourn, facing for sinners death on the cross, that he might save them from endless loss. 